All right, so let's keep going. So now we have to talk about the kind of the final triggers of World War One, right? I talked about some of the long-term things. I talked about the entangled alliances in the previous lecture. But now I want to talk about how all these alliances come together and how a boy, you know, and he's, you're going to see why I call him a boy. He's so young um, when you see an image of him is going to help trigger World War One. So let's get into our next slide here and talk about this Balkan area and what happens with these alliance systems and how it all explodes. So the Balkans, again, is this area just north of Greece. And this is, again, still a little complicated, so you want to follow it all carefully. You have Serbia, right? So Serbia is the Slavic nation that I mentioned right over here that has an alliance with Russia, remember, right? You also have these territories of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina. You can see where those are on the map. And again, in your modules, you have this flow chart to help you out with this. And those areas were regions that people in Serbia wanted to have. They, they wanted kind of a pan-Slavic Serbia. They said the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina, they're like us. They should be part of a greater Serbia. The problem is Austria-Hungary wanted that piece of real estate as well. So here you now you're seeing what you're having a conflict. This is where you get into a lot of what we call the Balkan Wars and the Balkan conflicts. And that's a whole other uh, separate lecture um, that, that um, I don't get into all the nuance on. You can obviously read about all that. Uh, but basically... You have these conflicts in the Balkans between Austria, Hungary and Serbia and Serbia wants Bosnia and Herzegovina and Austria, Hungary wants Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then you have this organization known as the Black Hand and this organization known as the Black Hand was this very extremist organization that wanted, again, Bosnia and Herzegovina to be part of Serbia and they were not operating officially as part of the Serbian government, but one of their members was a boy named Kavrio Princip. And actually in that movie, The Kingsman, they, they, they have him in the movie too, actually, it's kind of funny. Um, and he had a job and his job was to go and assassinate the Archduke Franz Ferdinand who was the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, 1914. He was the, um, Archduke is the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary. And in 1914, Gavrilo Princip does that very thing. Now, when he does this, I'm gonna show you an image of him in a second, this is going to create a massive domino effect. And I wanna read you something. This is an interesting excerpt. Um, from a British ambassador. This is before, this is before all this happened, right? Before this assassination takes place, this is what this British ambassador says about Serbia and Austria-Hungary. He says, Serbia will someday set Europe by the ears and bring about a universal war on the continent. It will be lucky if Europe succeeds in avoiding a war as a result of the present crisis. He's talking about the crisis in the Balkans. The next time a Serbian crisis arises, I feel sure that Austria-Hungary will refuse to admit of any Russian interference in the dispute and will proceed to settle her differences with her little neighbor by herself. So this British ambassador, before this assassination ever takes place, says um, this is a really dangerous spot because if things get heated between Serbia and Austria-Hungary, Russia gets involved, all of Europe will fall into a war. And what's eerie is what he predicted is exactly what's going to happen. So here is Gavrilo Princip. There he is, you know, so I say he's just, I think like 18, 19 years old. And he is the one who assassinates the Archduke Franz Ferdinand along with his wife. Um, he's of course gonna be captured when he does this. And once he's captured, uh, he'll be taken, he'll be put on trial. Uh, they didn't give him the death penalty. He actually tried to take cyanide to kill himself. That didn't work. Um, and eventually he'll die of tuberculosis in, in a prison. Um, so that's kind of what, what, what leads to his death. Um, and so anyways, this young boy, Gabriel Princip, assassinates the Archduke. Now you say, okay, well, how does this lead to a whole massive war? Well, let's look at our next slide and we see the domino effect of all this. So this is the domino effect. And so this is where I'm going to kind of use the markers here to kind of illustrate all this. And you got to really follow this carefully. 
Uh, but it, there's a logic to it. And now I'm not going to go like in exact order day by day. I just want to un understand the, the logic of what happened. So 1914, right, um, is the assassination. Within months, basically, all of this is going to happen, right? So here's Serbia. So, and here is Austria-Hungary. So when Princip kills the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungary is not gonna blame the black hand, they're gonna blame Serbia. They say, Serbia, this is your fault. And so they're going to say, Serbia, this means war. Now, if Serbia and Austria-Hungary at war, Russia up here, they're gonna say, well, no, 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 you can't fight against our little friend Serbia, and so they're going to be at war, right? In exact order and all that, that's not my number one concern. My number one concern is you understand how these alliances end up playing a role. Now, if Russia and Austria-Hungary are at war, well, remember Germany, right? Germany's got an alliance with Austria-Hungary. So, uh-uh, no, that means Germany is going to be fighting over there against Russia as well. Now, don't forget, Great Britain and France, they have an alliance with Russia. And then to get even more complicated, Great Britain also has an alliance with Belgium. I'm not even going to get into all of that. Um, but if Great Britain and France and it has, a, it has an alliance and, and with Russia and things get heated there, well, then Great Britain's going to be at war with France and Austria, Hungary and Russia as well. And don't forget the Ottoman Empire down here, right? And so the Ottoman Empire, they have an alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary. So guess what? They're going to be at war with Great Britain as the war breaks out. So all of this doesn't happen super quick, but it happens pretty fast, you know. And before anybody knew what was going on, all these countries are fighting each other in a war. And if you stop and you take a step back and you think about it, you go, wait a second, why again is Russia, why again is England fighting Germans? I mean, there was not really anything that particular. I mean, you can make an understanding of why France and Germany would be at war because of the whole Franco-Prussian war earlier, but there isn't really much logic to England being at war with Germany. But this whole alliance system um, uh, puts it together. I have a short little clip from this kind of comedy thing called Horrible Histories, and they walk you through this as well, and it's, it's, it's sad and funny at the same time, because a lot of it does not make any logical sense, um, it, but it happened, and this leads to a couple other factors, so I hope you got all that clear in terms of the domino effect, and then you can go back and kind of watch that again, and really for my courses, you have the, the flow chart that is in your module that will help you out, um, but that's not enough alone, right? There's a few other things that I always like to throw in in terms of why the war happened, other than, you know, these whole entangled alliances that people oftentimes don't think about. So let me go through a few other quick causes of why the war takes place. So one of the issues is this guy, Kaiser William II. And Kaiser William II, he is a very aggressive military type man. You know, it was said that he was, you know, had a bit of a, a handicap, birth defect. Um, so he's had some physical disabilities, uh, made him a bit rough when he was young, very angry. Uh, in that movie, The Kingsman, they actually depict him that way, too, which is kind of funny. But interesting, you see what he wears all the time. He's almost always wearing military uniform. So this guy definitely was one of those individuals when he had a chance to go fight war, he was pretty happy to go fight war. Um, another really just side, side note, all these rulers of Europe were all kind of related. Um, and again, that's just more genealogy stuff that I'm not going to get into, but they, they all ended up actually having some relationships. So there's this kind of, um, I guess, cousin rivalries between all these folks as well. And so Kaiser William II, he was very ready to go and fight a war. Another factor that I think helps bring about World War I that people don't often think about is when this assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand took place, they didn't have the sense of, hey, let's negotiate, let's talk it through, let's have some organization where we can meet and figure these things out. And so they were, I think, one of the causes of what they didn't have. They were kind of lacking strong international diplomacy where where they thought hey let's talk these things maybe we could do sanctions maybe there's another option 
you know, I think if an heir to the throne was assassinated today, I doubt in a month or two months, all of Europe would be at war. Uh, but in this case, they, they jumped into it. But then there's another factor, and this last factor is one that I emphasize in previous lectures and a, a concept that I talk about in great detail in terms of the mood of Europe leading up to the war. And remember, if you're living in Western civilization, before World War I breaks out, Western civilization, right? It's not a great time for you if you're being colonized in Africa or in Asia, but if you're living in Europe, you know, the Industrial Revolution, the progressive years, you're colonizing, you're, you're doing a lot of amazing things, and there's a sense of enthusiasm. And this last part of the lecture that I want to talk about in this particular video is very important. So I want you to really pay attention to what I'm about to say here and show you these images and read you some words. And so first the words. So there's this enthusiasm that you could be seen from primary sources. And there are a couple of writers, Roland Dojeda, a man named Stephen Zwig. One is from France, one is from Austria. And they both of them describe the moods in Europe as the war is breaking out. And you saw what I did. One is from France, right? And Steven Zwig, he's the one from Austria. So I gave you one from both sides. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read to you some excerpts from these sources. And I want you to kind of jot down the words as you listen to these, um, these primary sources and the attitude and the enthusiasm people felt as the war is breaking out. And then we're going to talk about does it make sense, right? So here's from... Um, Steve, uh, Roland Dogelet, I'll just read that one first. He says, uh, suddenly heroic wind lifted their heads. Young and old, civilian and military men burned with the same excitement. It was like Brotherhood Day. Beginning the next day, thousands of men eager to fight would jostle one another outside recruiting offices waiting to join up. I closed my eyes and they appeared to me those volunteers on that great day. And then this one, I think, is even more profound, a rushing feeling of fraternity. Listen to the words here. He says, and to be truthful, I must acknowledge that there was a majestic, rapturous, even seductive something at the first outbreak. He says, the trains were filled with fresh recruits. Banners were flying. Music sounded. In Vienna, I found the entire city in a tumult. And he says, all differences of class, ranks, and language were flooded over at that moment by a rushing feeling of fraternity. Strangers spoke to one another in the streets. People who had avoided each other for years shook hands. Everywhere one saw excited faces. The petty mail clerk who ordinarily sorted letters early and late, who sorted constantly, who sorted from Monday until Saturday without interruption. The clerk, the cobbler, had suddenly achieved a romantic possibility in life. Um, and he could become a hero, and everyone who wore a uniform was already being cheered by the woman and greeted beforehand with a romantic appellation by those who had to remain behind. So these authors are describing the moods in Europe at the time. And, you know, you look at, listen to those words, and then I want to show you this image. Look at this image, and this is them. They're off to war, and, and look at how the faces, and they're happy. And the question is, does these images and do those words make sense to a lot of people in 1914? And the answer to a lot of it, it does, right? Because, again, you're living in a time, they had not seen a big, massive war since probably the Napoleonic Wars. There were obviously wars, the Crimean War, and there was the Franco-Prussian War, but they had not seen anything like this before, and they had no idea what they were getting themselves into. And they were living this dream, a world where anything is possible, where you can colonize and unify and industrialize and, you know, do all of these, marry who you want to marry, romanticism, all of these things were happening. And so in a lot of ways, it made sense that many people felt that way. Not everybody felt that way. There were some people who said, this is going to be a bloody mess. But a lot of people saw this and they were living this dream. Well, what we're about to see is this dream is going to turn into a nightmare when the war begins. And it is a nightmare that will forever change the entire history of the world. And so the next phase of my lectures are to actually discuss the war itself. All right, so I hope all that's clear. You understand kind of the causes. If you have any questions, please let me know, especially on those entangled alliances. I know that gets a little tricky for people. Um, and that's it. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll keep going on our next lecture. Have a good day.